I've always been one to shy away from painting backgrounds in watercolour, but more and more lately I've been experimenting with a few different background techniques. And today I thought I'd compile some of them in this video so that they're all in one place. Painting backgrounds is something that I feared for a long time. I avoided doing them for fear that I would wreck my painting. Lately I'm starting to experiment with them and I'm having a lot of fun doing it. In this video I'll show you some examples and I'll demonstrate how I did them. Sometimes I paint my backgrounds wet on wet and other times I'll paint them wet on dry. Sometimes I might use other things to help me, like an old painting brush. Or some plastic kitchen wrap. Sometimes I'll fill in the entire background. And other times I'll put a small splash of colour somewhere to fill up some negative space or create some direction for the viewer's eye. Sometimes I'll paint them first before I paint my subject. And other times I might paint them halfway through my painting. Or I might paint them at the end of my painting when I'm finished painting my subject. The first technique I want to show you is painting the background wet on wet. I'll demonstrate what I do quickly on some scrap paper first because there's something that I want to specifically show you about the water in the paint and then I'll show you how I use it on my painting. Working wet on wet just means that you're working on wet paper so you're going to put wet paint on wet paper. I wet the paper where I want to work with some water. I cover it evenly and I don't wet the entire background at once. If I wet it all at once, sections of it would dry before I got to paint on it. So I wet the background section by section. I'll demonstrate that on a painting in a little while. So when the paper's wet, I pick up the wet paint and I paint that onto the wet paper. What I have to make sure when I do this is that I keep the edges of the paint away from the edges of the water. So the water extends past where I finish the paint. Here you can see the edge of the water and you can see that I'm keeping that paint away from the edge. The reason I do that is because if I was to take the paint all the way to the edge of where the water is, I would get a hard paint line forming on my paint. So you can see there's a hard line there at the edge of the water as opposed to a soft line of paint where it stays within the water's edge. So along here is a hard edge, whereas this edge here is soft. The reason I'm working on the wet paper is because I want soft paint edges. Sometimes I don't necessarily want the background to just be one colour. This is a alizarin crimson that I'm using, and the blue that I used was French ultramarine. Because there's water on the paper, the two colours blend together softly by themselves. I don't really have to do anything. When I change colours, when I'm working like this, I wash my brush out between colours so that I don't dirty one colour with the other. So when I put the blue on and I want to put more of the alizarin crimson on, I'll wash the blue out of my brush before I go into my alizarin crimson. If it gets really wet and I can see that there's a lot of water on the paper, sometimes I'll tilt my paper to make the water run to the edge. And then I'll take a tissue or a paper towel and I'll wipe off the excess moisture. And that stops watercolour blooms from forming where I don't want them. What I just did then on that scrap piece of paper is what I did when I painted the background on this chrysanthemum painting. I painted the chrysanthemum first 
and then when it was finished I carefully painted around the edge of the petals section by section on wet paper. I've just painted the top left corner and now I'm wetting the next section. I have to paint the water carefully because I don't have any masking fluid around the edge of my flower. If I would have put masking fluid on there it would have made this job easier but for some reason I didn't bother. So my water comes down to here but I'll make sure my paint stops short of the water so I won't take the paint all the way to the water's edge because if I was to do that I'd get a hard edge there and I don't want a hard edge. I want all of the background to be soft edges. There's enough hard edges on the flower I don't need any more. This is Windsor Violet that I'm using. I have to paint it carefully up around the edge of the petals. And then once I get around the petals, I can put it on fairly quickly. Because that top left section is still wet, the purple blends into the blue that's there by itself. I don't really have to do much. Just make sure I don't have too much paint there. I keep turning my board so that I can get right up next to the petal. So now I'm using a smaller brush so I can get closer to the petal. And I'm using blue this time instead of Windsor Violet. So I keep that paint away from that paint edge. When I get closer to the paint edge, I stop painting and then I put some more water on and I keep going. So then I wet the next section with water and then I can keep going with the paint. I don't wet it all at once because it'll dry before I get to it. Once this layer of paint is dry, I can re-wet it and paint another layer the same way over the top if I want to. I can paint as many layers as I want to get it as dark as I want or I can leave it as I've got it here. The reason I painted the background after I finished the painting was because when I started the painting I intended to leave the background white. Then when I finished it I stood back and looked at it and I changed my mind and I decided that I wanted a background after all. Usually when I know what I want the painting to look like I'll paint the background first before I paint the subject. And sometimes when I do that I might have to mask off areas of my subject so that I don't risk getting any paint where I don't want it. With this painting here I painted a variegated wash on the background. I filled in the entire background with paint. So I knew that I wanted to make sure I didn't get any paint on my little fairy wren. So I taped off his tummy area, the main area there, and then on the rest of it I'm painting on some masking fluid and that will protect it when I put the paint on. That's all covered now, ready for me to put the paint on. I make sure my paint's ready, then I wet the paper. I do it section by section, I don't wet it all at once. And then I put the paint on section by section. Instead of carefully painting up to the edge of things like I did with the chrysanthemum, here I can splash the paint on because I've covered the bird with masking fluid. I'll use more than one colour on this background as well. And as I said earlier, I like to wash my paint out between colours to keep the colours pure. So once I've got the paint where I want it, then I wet the next section where I want to work. And on goes the paint. And I keep going until I get it the way I want it. I take off any excess paint to make sure I don't get watercolour blooms where I don't want them. After the background was completely dry I took all the masking fluid off. I took off the tape and then I painted the bird. And there it is finished. Sometimes I might want some watercolour blooms on my background to help add interest to the painting and that's what I did with this cat painting. 
with this cat painting, I didn't mask anything off. I painted around the edge of the cat like I did when I did the background of the chrysanthemum painting. So here I've wet the background and I'm painting on some Payne's Grey. This is a white cat and because I won't be putting any white paint on here, the edge of the background forms the edge of the cat. Once I get the edge on the way I want it, then I can put the rest of the paint on fairly quickly. Because it's wet, I can fiddle with it a bit and add some more paint if I want to. I've got the time to do that. I can use my little brush now and add some more detail to the edge of the cat. Then I start to dry it off with my hair dryer. And before it completely dries, I drop in some water with my brush and that disturbs the pigment and it creates some watercolour blooms. So these are deliberate watercolour blooms and they're going to add some texture and some interest to my background. And I put them where I want them to go. Okay, so there's three examples where I've filled in the entire background. Sometimes I don't want to fill in the entire background. I might want to keep it simple and just add a little bit of colour, like I did here on this goldfish. I deliberately pushed this goldfish to the right-hand side of the paper so that I could put some water in front of it where the negative space is. And I wanted a little bit behind the goldfish as well. So I wet that area behind and I'm going to drop a little bit of blue paint on the wet paper there. This is French Ultramarine. I used this blue on the goldfish. So instead of getting another blue out, I decided to repeat the colour here on the background. Then I wet the paper in front of the fish and I did the same thing. I decided to take some of the paint up into the negative space that I've got here and that helps to create a bit of direction and movement as well. The next technique that I want to show you is painting wet on dry. Before I do that though, I'd like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes for creative people. They've got classes on lots of different topics, including illustration, graphic design, photography, creative writing, music, all sorts of different crafts, and even cooking. If you're a lifelong learner like me, you're bound to find hundreds of classes that will inspire you. For example, I don't have any fancy photography equipment. I use my iPhone to do all of my filming. I use it to film my tutorials for Patreon and I use it to film these YouTube videos. I also use it to take photos of the subject that I paint. I'm no expert on photography or videoing, but I'm trying to learn as much as I can. So I'm currently enjoying this class by Dale McManus. It's called iPhone Photography, how to make pro photos on your iPhone. Dale is a professional photographer and videographer. And in this class, he shares lots of tips and tricks about taking stunning photos using your iPhone. So I'm really enjoying it and I'm learning things that I didn't even know I could do with the camera on the phone. The classes on Skillshare are curated especially for learning. There are no annoying ads and they're always launching new premium classes. An annual subscription costs less than $10 US a month, so it's affordable. If you want to explore the site and have a look around, I've included a link to Skillshare in the description of this video. For a limited time, use that link to get a free trial of Skillshare premium membership. Okay, back to this. Wet on dry. Wet on dry means that I'm painting wet paint on dry paper, so I don't bother wetting the paper first. That gives me hard paint edges. 
and sometimes the brush will skip over the paper creating some interesting texture. Lately I've been painting these quick loose splashes in the negative space beside my subject. I use a fairly large brush so that I'm not tempted to fuss with the paint once I've put it on the paper. On my black cockatoo painting here I'd finished washing in that first layer of paint onto the cockatoo and I dried that off really well with my hairdryer. And then I got my big paddle brush and some of the paint that I used on the cockatoo and I painted this splash on there as quickly as I could. This is on dry paper though, I haven't wet the paper here. Then I wash the paint out of my brush and I use it to soften any edges that I don't like. So I do that really quickly and I try not to fuss with it. And here's the finished painting. I did the same thing here with this giraffe painting, although with this painting I'd finished painting my giraffe and I decided that I needed a splash of colour in front of it. The paper here is dry and I haven't put any masking fluid onto my giraffe at all. I've got a two inch flat brush here and I'm using some grey that I used on the giraffe. So I'm not introducing a new colour, I'm repeating the colour that I've already used. And again, I'm trying not to fuss, I just want to get the paint on there and leave it alone. I decided to drop a little bit of water into this one and I took the paint a bit closer to the giraffe. Then I got my brush and I flicked some Windsor Violet paint on there. And that's how it looked when it was finished. Sometimes before I pick up the paint I'll do a few practice strokes with my clean brush. I'll stand in front of my painting and I'll have an idea where I want the paint to go and I'll sweep over the paper with my brush a few times. Then when I'm ready I'll pick up the paint and I'll go for it. So here goes with the yellow. I do it as quickly as I can and then I might pick up a second colour and I'll put a second colour on there. These are the colours that I'm going to use on the Badriga. So I'm thinking, looking at it, thinking I might need a bit more green here, but I don't want to fuss with it. I stand back and have a look at it and then I decide to put another little flick up the top here. Because the Badriga is yellow, I can take my tissue and just dab off the excess that's there. So I didn't bother about painting some masking fluid around the edge of this one. And here's how this gorgeous boy turned out. I'm finding the important thing for me to remember when I paint those loose, splashy backgrounds is to do it quickly. Get in, get out, minimal fuss. I think of it as though I'm trying to paint a sky. I want to paint it as quickly as I can without too many brush strokes. If I fuss with it, it will show on my finished painting and the viewer will see that I've struggled with it. I mentioned in another video that this is where I need to trust the paint, trust the paper and trust myself. I don't know what it's going to look like when it's dry. I have to trust in the materials that I'm using. Another suggestion for a background technique that I've used is to create texture with plastic kitchen wrap like I did here on these two paintings. I demonstrated this background in another video so have a look at that if you're curious. So there you are, there's some background ideas for you. I hope I gave you some inspiration. Please give this video a like and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already because I post watercolour videos full of hints and tips like this one every week. I'll see you next week with a new video. Take care. That'll do. Sometimes I might use other things to help help. <coughs>
help, help. Background on this chrysanthemum painting. I painted the background first because if you want to explore the site and have a look around, I've included the classes on Skillshare are curated, especially for learning, curated, curated. An annual subscription costs less than $10 US a month, so it's affordable. If you want to explore it and have a look around, do you want to have a look around? I've included a link to Skillshare in the, the description and I got stumbled over the description. In the description. Finding the important thing to remember with those loose, splashy brack brack backgrounds. Brack grounds. Come on the wings. There's a little bird at the windowsill. It's just had a bath. Hey little dude. 